Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. This time round we're dealing with and looking at another of my favourites. It's the Aston Martin DBS V8. Um, and this car, uh, as much as any, exemplifies the, the, the pretty parlous nature of um, how car manufacturers in Italy, um, in other parts of the world, but not least of all Great Britain at the time, in the late 60s and early 70s, operated. Hand to mouth doesn't really cover it. Um, and the analogy of a swan, everything looking wonderful, a car positioned beautifully, gleaming under the lights at the motor show stand, um, and the reality and what's going on behind the scenes in the back rooms is just completely different. Um, and this car sort of throws that into sharp focus. The Aston Martin DBS, the, the 4, 5 and 6 had been soldiering on through the, uh, the 1959 to 1969, 1970. And, um, they were very popular, but the problem is they were rehashing um, things over and over again. So Aston Martin needed something new and they needed something quick. A British guy called William Towns, who conveniently left drawings hanging around the Aston Martin offices, uh, eventually got the job of uh, styling this car, which started life as a four-door car, uh, the Lagonda, which they made only seven of, and was compressed into this car, the Coupe. Um, and it was always intended to have Aston Martin's shiny new, wonderful four cam V8 engine. But unfortunately, um, they took it racing to Le Mans to try and prove its um, hardiness. And when they got back to the factory and stripped the engine, the two examples they took, they were both absolutely uh, worn out and destroyed. Uh, the blocks were warped, um, all sorts of things wrong with them. The engine, which went on to power Aston Martins for 20 years, uh, very, very successfully. It uh, started life very ingloriously indeed, very much like the Rolls-Royce Merlin, uh, the engine that um, was so influential in uh, almost every theatre of World War II and went on to make the Mustang a fantastic uh, American-built and designed aircraft. Um, but it start the Merlin started life with all sorts of problems and rehashes, and uh, this one was the same. Um, so what they did was they, um, they, they launched the Aston Martin DBS, this shape, but with the, the, uh, the Tadek Marek design six-cylinder engine, which had served them so well. But the problem is this is a big, heavy car. So the result was that the replacement for the DB6, which was supposed to be this svelte, fast, new coupe you see behind me here, um, was anything but. It was heavier, it was slower. Um, who wants a car that's slower than the model before? It sort of doesn't really help sales. So they struggled on um, while they, in the back rooms, were frenetically uh, redesigning the V8. And it took them 18 months to get the V8 right. Um, so this car, as I say, was sold as a stopgap uh, with the six-cylinder engine until it got the V8. And what a V8 it is. Uh, it's 5340cc. I mean, this is very much in the public domain. Um, but there are one or two interesting facts and figures uh, around this car. One of them is that Sir David Brown, um, who owned Aston Martin for a number of years, hence the DB in the model uh, descriptions, um, he actually admitted um, to somebody who I know, so this is second hand, so it's pretty reliable, that every one of these cars was made either three or four inches wider than it should have been every single one because they got the body bucks wrong in 1967. They actually got some of the dimensions wrong and rather than uh, remake all the jigs for everything they actually just increased the specification of the windscreen and the back window and everything else, the bumpers, and that's why these cars have such an incredibly wide centre console. So when you're sat in the car you're about that distance from the other seat. Um, and it's because these cars are always three or four inches, I don't know the exact figure and he can't remember, um, wider than they should have been. So a very strange fact indeed. But um, net result of all this activity was when uh, the car came out in 1969, the DBS V8, it was the fastest four-seater in the world. 
Um, and uh, it wasn't that far behind the fastest cars, in, production cars in the world. Um, beautiful V8, it, they used the uh, Bosch injection system, the eight plunger pump from the Mercedes 600, the 6.3 M100 engine. And Aston Martin used uh, um, individual throttle bodies, whereas the Mercedes used a fairly simple linkage uh, with um, a link up to the throttle to synchronize the, the fueling of the pump, the movement of the rack as it's called inside the pump, with the throttle opening and position. Um, Aston Martin went a far more complicated route um, which was to use individual throttles for every cylinder, much like a multi-carburetted car or a very modern high-performance um, in industrial, uh, industrial? Internal combustion engine. The engine is a real work of art in this car, but it does mean that the throttle linkage and the, the fuel injection pump linkage is extremely difficult to set up. Um, if I tell you that the rods that uh, go from the injection pump to the linkage that goes across the back of the engine and then to the throttle bodies, there's actually verniers on them to set them up accurately. If I tell you that they are accurate to a tenth of a millimeter, those linkages, that's how to specification they have to be for everything to work properly. So it takes some setting up this engine. Um, we've had done a lot of work on this car uh, mechanically, we've refurbished the engine compartment completely and it looks fabulous now. Um, it looked pretty grotty and sorry for itself before, um, but we've, uh, Alex has done a wonderful job. We've replanted bits, repainted them all to original specification, um, crackle finished the cam covers, um, given the engine a good service, adjusted everything, the timing chains. Craig's made a new set of carpets for it. Um, this car is now really a very different car to that which it came in. And again, for a budget, we've managed to add um, a considerable amount of value to this car. Uh, it's now, it's got the manual gearbox, which makes a big difference. It makes these cars uh, very, very uh, exciting to drive, even for a car of its age. Um, and uh, I'm, I love the color. This is called olive green. It was the same color as the DBS6, the six cylinder car that George Lazenby drove in on Her Majesty's Secret Service, um, the Bond film. Um, and this car, there's always been a bit of a question mark over how much this engine actually produces, but it's something I estimate, the, the figures range from around about 315 brake horsepower. I think it's more like 325 because that this is a heavy car, the engine's got to pull some weight along and they did on a good day do over 160 miles an hour when they were new, 0 to 60 in about six seconds. These were spectacular figures for 1969 for a production four seat car. Um, in fact, they were the most spectacular figures. So question mark around power output, I'm guessing 325 brake horsepower, something like that. But when they are set up, these things are an absolute treasure to drive. That lovely combination of British bulldog power and huge presence, and yet that lovely handcrafted Wilton carpeted and Connolly leather interior, acres of um, leather and carpet in this interior. Um, so uh, we've, we've been spending a lot of time working on the injection system in particular, refurbishing the engine, Craig's done the carpets. It's time to take this car out on the road and see if it delivers. Couldn't be simpler than that. Well, one of the things I've uh, noticed immediately with my BDI out on road test um, is that the, uh, just to get, start off extremely nerdy, the windscreen wiper blades are modern uh, black metal and plastic equivalents of um, the, uh, the originals. Uh, originally this car would have been equipped with Trico Speed Blades, uh, which were used by quite a lot of cars at the time. Jaguar E-Type Series 3s, um, Lamborghini Espadas, uh, lots of other uh, Jaguar XJs, lots of other sort of prestige cars. They were uh, considered the last word in windscreen wiper technology. And I actually have a source of them, so we're going to purchase a couple uh, with the owners, uh, I'm just going to suggest that the owner does that um, because I think it will just finish off this car quite nicely. And wiper, wiper blades are a big deal to me because people so often get them wrong. I went to a Concours at Windsor Castle some years ago 
and there is a Ferrari 250 GTO, a genuine car, um, all of uh, getting on for 80, 90 million dollars and it had black plastic wiper blades on it. I actually wondered if somebody had done it deliberately just to be irreverent to the Concorde, but uh, I doubt it. I think it was probably a genuine emission, omission of um, attention to detail. Anyway, I'm just going to warm the car up now and uh, then we'll see if all that work on the fuel injection system is paying off. Yeah, the, all that intricate adjustment that's so crucial on them. Um, actually, let's see if it pays off now. And of course, the rev, rev counter is not uh, hooked up yet because it's early road testing days. But let's see if that Aston Martin V8 magic is there. Yes, it is. Woo! That is still a fast car. It feels like the fastest production four-seater in the world from its time. Beautiful power curve. I think we might have to do that again. Now, of course, part of setting up any car is making sure that it pulls properly from low revs, which with modern traffic is where most of the, the, t the car's time is spent and most of the driving is spent. So I'm gonna put this car under great pressure now and just lower the revs almost to idle and then floor the throttle. And just to make sure that fuel injection system is behaving 100% well. bellow from that hand-built four-cam Aston Martin V8 with individual throttle bodies. Something that every self-respecting uh, racer, a teen racer, cringes for now and craves for is uh, individual throttle bodies. And here they were in, 19, in the late 1960s. Um, this car was announced in 1969 and it must have been a revelation to drive this thing at that time. So utterly throttle responsive, like an Italian V12, um, and uh, quick. It really pushes you back in the seat. We'll just try it again. Wow, well, just sensational. We've got some fine tuning to do. We've got to get the rev counter sorted out, um, but uh, this is well on the way to being finished and it's many a year since this car has run like this. They are very difficult, as I mentioned earlier, to set up these, very difficult. Oh, I am a happy chappy. This is addictive. This is called getting hooked on Aston Martin V8. Of course, being very powerful for its day, something in the region of 325 brake horsepower, um, there weren't that many gearboxes that could cope with the torque. So Aston Martin, um, the days of David Brown making his own gearboxes were actually long since gone. And for cost reasons, Aston Martin uh, turned to ZF, um, not the cheapest gearbox in the world, but a lot cheaper than developing their own. And it was a five-speed gearbox, which of course again was state-of-the-art for the 1960s. Um, Four-speed plus overdrive was the norm, and uh, this is a five-speed dogleg. And it, that means, um, if I just pull over... So we've got the usual gate across. Reverse is where first would normally be. 
and then first is a dog leg back and left. So we use that to pull away first gear and then the shift the gear changes to second is like that. It takes no time at all to get used to it but um, it's just one of the quirks of this car. These gearboxes are fitted to lots of things. Um, Maseratis, uh, lots of high performance cars of the era. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be back with something else very soon.